Hello and welcome to our second video on um, from the Billingsgate Roman House and Baths in our series. Um, if you remember, my name is Kim Bidelf and I'm joined by my colleague Andrew Lane. Say hi, Andrew. Hello. <laughs> Uh, today, for another um, new thing that we're trying out, we have a speaker um, from outside our organisation, Dr. Simon Elliott. Hi, Simon. Hi, Kim. Lovely to be uh, to, to be with you this afternoon. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us today. It's really nice of you to to come and talk to us. Um, and um, Simon Elliott is going to talk to us today about Kentish Ragstone because he's been doing quite a lot of research for his um, uh, PhD on Kentish Rex, well it's done now, and um, where it comes from and why is it important for us. Um, so I'm going to hand over to him because he can tell us more, but we will kind of ask him some questions as we go along as well. So over to you. I shall move on to the first slide, shall I? Great stuff. Well again, thank you for having me guys. It's uh, lovely to uh, be able to support the amazing Billingsgate Bathhouse uh, in the City of London. Um, I uh, moved, in fact, where, I'm, where we're recording from now, actually, is very relevant to the story I'm going to tell you, because I'm in my office um, in the house I live in, in East Farley, which is in the Upper Medway Valley. And I can remember going to a talk by a local archaeological organisation when we moved in in 2004, would you believe? 16 years, goodness me. Makes me feel old. And I can remember the guys there uh, giving a presentation about... Um, the Roman activity in the Medway Valley. And one of the things that became clear was that the industrial activity here was all about quarrying ragstone, which was used in Roman London. And I asked the question, innocently, do you know where the quarries were? And I got told, no, it's not important. And that clearly to me was a red rag to a bull. So I made an academic career out <laughs> of where the ragstone was, which is probably a little bit sad. Uh, but within about a kilometre where I'm sitting right now with Hector, the archaeological dog, my golden doodle, there are five ragstone quarries which effectively provided all of the stone which built most of Roman London and the urban environment, the built environment in the southeast of uh, Roman Britain through to the middle of the third century when it all very mysteriously stops. And then there's a detective story as well. So it's an incredible tale. Um, this, is a, this is a talk I give frequently when I'm um, doing my lectures. I've um, been involved in two or three television programmes about it. Um, so it's a story very close to my heart. And, and the presentation today is based on the deck I usually use when I'm giving lectures. Um, and it's nearly all images. So what I'll be doing is I'll be talking, uh, I'll be talking uh, to images, mostly, and just anecdotally telling the story of these ragstone quarries. And guys, feel free to shout out if you want to ask any questions, because I can't see your images on screen. So just let me know if you want to ask any questions and we can have a conversation at any point you want to. So we'll start off with this first image. And the first image is fantastic. The opening slide and it shows some ragstone in situ used by the Romans. This is beautifully worked ragstone blocks from the Upper, upper Medway Valley. And this, this, this wall you can see in front of you, this is actually uh, part of the Severan land wall built by the great warrior Emperor Septimius Severus um, around AD 199. Uh, and uh, that can be found outside Tower Hill tube station. And all the stone there came from the quarries in the Upper Medway Valley. And you can see Roman stone being used in situ right there. Next, you can see this image of the, the, the River Medway. Uh, this is near one of my villa sites I'm excavating. And I argue in my presentation that the Roman um, villas were inhabited by people who ran the quarries on behalf of the Roman state uh, through the middle of the third century. And again, look at the lovely view of the Medway there. What's not to like? Finally, here on the first page, you have this great view of the Blackfriars One ship which is a merchant vessel excavated in the 1960s. And it's a very important vessel because it shows part of the, the, the economic model used by the Romans to transport the ragstone, because when it founded, this vessel had 26 tonnes of Kentish ragstone in its hold. So that was stone which had been quarried in the Medway Valley, and which was on its way to being used in London, but never was for whatever reason. So if mm -hmm. we can move on to the next slide. Does that come up? So, yeah, that's great. So we've got a bit of ex a bit of um, bit of expectation management for everybody here. So uh, in the presentation, I want to talk about the research, and then the region. So the Medway Valley, the Upper Medway Valley in particular. Then I'm going to talk about where the ragstone was used in Roman London, which of course includes the Billingsgate Bathhouse. Then I'm going to actually, for you, the viewers, identify exactly where the quarries were where the stone came from. And it's worth bearing in mind that one of these quarries at 2.6 kilometres long 
was possibly the largest man-made hole in Roman Europe. So this gives you a sense of the scale of the endeavour we're talking about. Uh, I want to talk about who quarried the stone, because some people profited from the stone, the stone being quarried, but some people certainly didn't. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the journey to London and the economic model. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about what happened to the industry, this detective story. And finally, I'm going to give some conclusions and tell, tell all the people viewing what the next steps are going to be. And in the images here, this is all sort of from my research. So top left here, you have an image of a Roman milestone, which is a longer length of Roman road linking the big quarry, the 2.6 kilometre long quarry to a Roman villa and ford on the River Medway. Or is it a milestone? We'll see when we get to it in the presentation. The road itself, you can see on the right there, that is the road. And that's uh, a discovery that Hector, the archaeological dog and I, made about five years ago when we were walking um, near the quarry. That is a Roman road surface. Uh, that's no way! Where Absolutely. And you can see the agar to the left. Yeah, there. you can. The, but you, um, you could mistake it for being like a modern farmed, you know, farm metal road surface, couldn't you? Except that, Kim, this is a great question. So this is a prop. This is proper archaeology. I, I love I, I love this. We've uh, taken a section through it and we found Roman um, smashed up tile in the surface. And we've actually excavated the ditches either side as well. We've got Roman material. So it's def definitively a Roman uh, Roman road. Fantastic. Wow. Uh, and, and the reason and, I mean, I'll come to it later. But it's a really interesting story about why it's actually uh, where it is. It's in a place near Cox Tees which are the, the, the high ground above Maidstone, above the River Medway. And until the late 19th century, that was a, a wooded area called the Frights. And it was the, it was the badlands of Maidstone where all the highwaymen lived. Um, so it wasn't used for agricultural purposes because it's quite high up. So it's only in the late 19th, early 20th century when the agricultural technology is there to open it up that the farmers started cutting the trees down in the fright and they left the road surface in place because they couldn't get the plough through it. Because if, if you talk to any of the farms in the Medway Valley, one of the issues they have with all the ragstone here is that it's always breaking their blades. Well, here, they literally couldn't get through it. So that preserved a Roman road for me to find with Hector, the archaeological dog, who we may get to see later. He's sitting with me right now. And finally, we have a classic Romano-Celtic temple. So where I'm sitting in my office, if I look towards the river, and I'm, I'm, I'm probably about 300 meters from the river on a, on a terrace above the river if i look to my right uh, left sorry at 45 degrees 50 meters away there's a roman villa um so effectively i'm sitting in the ground of a roman villa as i'm talking to you and we found a romano celtic temple in the, the in the villa at east farley so so things couldn't be more roman do you guys have any questions before i carry on no 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 please carry on i will crack on then so let's move on to the next slide so we have um, a slide I always use when I'm talking about sort of Roman Britain more broadly. And, and this slide always reminds me to say that I believe that Britain was the wild west of the Roman Empire. In, in actual fact, I spent all morning writing my 11th book, which is for pen and sword, and it's called Roman Conquest Britannia. And I begin that by saying one could almost make the case that uh, Britannia was almost a failed province for the Romans. You're a long way from Rome. Um, there's always an exponentially large military presence um, because the, the far north never conquered. So probably 12 percent of the Roman military establishment in what is only 4 percent of the geographic area. Um, and the north and the west of the province uh, wasn't really a full fat part of the province. So I, don't think, I think it was a military frontier zone where the whole economy was bent towards maintaining this massive military presence. And being a long way from Rome and having a big military presence meant certainly later in the empire during the dominate phase of empire you have a lot of usurpers coming from, um, <laughs> from Britain as well. so britain to my mind is the wild west of the roman empire and it's within that story that we can start to consider the industries in roman britain remember the economy of um, of the roman empire is principally agrarian but they did have significant industries and the the, the, the extractive industries uh, which are called the metalla um, they're, they're very significant, especially here in the Medway Valley, where you have these five ragstone quarries. So next slide, please. So very, very quickly, I'll just touch on here um, how this, my research all fits in with um, the, the subsequent PhD. I graduated with a PhD in 2017. But the red rag to a bull research began after that fateful meeting in 2004, where no one could tell me where these quarries were. And the first thing I did to set me on the route was when I did my MA in archaeology at UCL, probably about seven or eight years ago. Uh, for my thesis, I, I, I looked at whether the Medway could have been canalised by the Romans to open it up in the upriver section to allow these quarries 
to use it because without the river being canalized with lots of weirs, the river's a stream effectively above the tidal reach. So you couldn't use it on a huge level for, in, in, uh, for, for supporting industry. So I actually identified where I think the Roman locks and weirs were, and that's the touch paper which set me on the route to doing the PhD to actually find the quarries. So the next thing we're going to look at, if you'll move on for me, please, Kim, is a very important part of the story, and that part of the story is about the geology. Mm. Because the ragstone obviously is a stone, so it fits into a sort of a geological narrative. So what you can see here in front of you is a fantastic I image which shows you the various geologies are, which are sort of uh, evident in Kent and which dominated Roman industry and agriculture and settlement in Kent. So firstly, uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the grey band going through the middle, which has got Maidstone in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And it goes in the horseshoe. You can see it goes in the horseshoe towards Hastings. That is um, the Lower Greensand Formation, within which sits the hide beds, within which sits the ragstone. And ragstone is a very high quality, to my mind, limestone because it's very workable, but it's also very wearable, which is why we can still see it in places like the wonderful Beddingsgate Bathhouse today. This image is also great for me because it enables me to contextualise the settlements of Roman Kent for all the viewers. So in the Roman period, the settlement in Kent was broadly along the line of the A2, so Watling Street, which began um, above Dover at Richborough and then went through to Rochester and then went through to Southwark and then went through into Roman London to mm. the Port of Basilica, which is where Leadenhall Market is, and then it followed broadly the line of Cheapside before going through Aldersgate, uh, um, going going through to the City Road, where it then became the Euston Road, where it was the A5 and goes through to Rochester and the Welsh Marshals. So this is the Roman M1, the principal roadway mm. in uh, Roman, Roman Britain. Uh, so you have settlements, sometimes fairly intensive along the uh, other side of Watling Street, but also you have settlement down the principal river valleys as well. And these are the Stowers near Canterbury, the Medway near Maidstone, and then the Dow Valley as well. Uh, sorry, the Derrick Valley as well. So those three river valleys are where you find the principal settlements along with Watling Street in um, Roman Kent. And the differential between the Stour and the Darrant with the Medway is that the former the Stour and the Darrant were principally fine living, but in the Medway Valley, it was very utilitarian because it was this massive industrial enterprise. The other point I make on that fantastic image as well is that there was one other metaller in Roman Kent, probably, I think, paired with the ragstone quarrying, probably with the same operate, uh, team operating the running of the quarry is probably based in Rochester. And um, this was the iron industry in the Weald. And we have a Roman road I'll talk about later, which is broader than the line of the modern A229, which goes from Rochester down to just above Hastings, where it stops around some massive Roman iron working sites. And that was the administrative road, I argue, for the Roman uh, metallic operations in the Medway Valley and in the Weald. And if we go on to the next slide, which is the next geology slide, Kim, and then maybe uh, stop to have a quick chat before we move on to where the stone was used. This is a fantastic slide because what it does, it gives you a, a, um, a, a, a cut straight through the geology of Kent. And you can see you have the Thames estuary on the left and you have the south coast on the right. What you can see here are the geological bands. The, these are all sedimentary rocks laid, but laid down in the Cretaceous period, largely, um, and then domed by the creation of the Alps about two million years ago. So you've had this formation, which is very unusual, called the Wealden Dome, which runs all the way through Kent. And because all these sedimentary rocks weather in differential way, what you tend to find is that you end up north to south in Kent with a very jagged geology and hence geography, whereas it's much easier, to, and that means it's much more difficult to travel then and now north to south when you're in uh, Kent, whereas it's much easier to go east to west, where mm. you can go along the lines of these uh, geological formations. So think of the M2 or the M20 and the A2, for example. So if you, go, if you go to the next slide, and then I'll take any questions you've got, guys, before we carry on. Well, I was going to ask Simon, actually, um, what do you think about um, the salt industry as well? Because that's going on on that north co uh, Kent coast, isn't it? Um, I think I think the key differential here, Kim, is scale, because e even after the ragstone story, by the way, I, I don't want to give too much away about my detective story until the end, because it's, it's a very good payoff. But the, the ragstone quarrying mm -hmm. and the iron, iron industry both finish at the same time. Okay, mm -hmm. 
uh, and they are later replaced by smaller iterations, which are over 10 times smaller. So the large scale state run operations disappear. And I would argue from my own research, the salt manufacturing as, a, as an example, I know that uh, people have looked at other industries in Kent, now beer manufacturing is an example, but I think it's a much smaller scale. What we're mm. talking about, I believe, is our, our imperial estates. So this is land which is specifically owned by the emperor, given over to either agriculture or industry. So in our case, it's industry. And you have the Upper Medway Valley and certainly the Weald, but I think also the Medway Valley probably being imperial estates. So the scale, the differential is absolutely enormous. And again, this is why it's so interesting that it all disappears in the middle of the third century. Mm. Great, great. So shall I carry on? Yeah, Andrew, do you want to ask Yeah, anything? I just wanted to ask a little bit about Kentish Ragstone. Yeah, that's the main building material. But were the Romans bringing other stones into, into Londinium? Uh, they, they, they were, in actual fact, one of the thing, one of the most time-consuming things doing my PhD is I, I, I did a detailed analysis of all the, the stone used by the Romans in Kent and the, the southeast during the occupation, including, of course, London. And ragstone is the principal building material, but you have other materials coming in, various sandstones from the various sandstone formations, uh, which are also used, uh, but not on the same scale. And then you also, in locales have the local building materials being used as well but with the ragstone being the principal building material if it's available so on the east kent coast for example you go to the villa at folkestone um and usually the first iteration of the villa at folkestone is built from tufa from the dow valley uh, mm -hmm. near Dover. very unusual building stone uh because it weathers very badly uh when they had much better quality stone in the cliffs there actually at folkestone they had uh, very fine green sands there and they had their own outcrops of ragstone, although not as good as the, the maintenance crop of ragstone. Um, and, and you have chalk being used as well. I mean, there's, a, there's argued to be a Mithraeum near Burr and Waldham in the um, lower Medway Valley, possibly marking the site of where the AD 43 um, Cordian River crossing battle took place. And stone, which is maintained in Maidstone Museum from there, which has been incised, and being used in a building, certainly thought by some to be a, a Mithraeum, um, that's chalk. So you have this very fine quality building potentially, but with chalk being used. So mm -hmm. there's, all, there's, an economic, there's an economic imperative um, there to use locally used building materials if it's available, which tells fantastically to my tale about Roman London being used, uh, Ragstone being used in the building of Roman London, because of the incredible, and we'll go into it in a minute, but the incredible distances involved in transporting the stone which shows how good quality this building material was. Really and I can, show, I, can show, I can show you the picture right in front of you, possibly, possibly the most simplistic picture I've got in the whole deck, but it's one of my favorites, simply because uh, it really graphically tells you where all the stone was used, which mm -hmm. is everywhere. You can find ragstone being used in the, 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 the industrial zone in Southwark. You can find the governor's palace beneath Cannon Street. Railway station was built from ragstone. Uh, we've got, um, probably the bridge abutments for London Bridge, if not the bridge piers, using Kentish Ragstone. We've got the Billingsgate Bathhouse, which is further to the west near the wall, used, built from Kentish Ragstone. We've got the Basilica and Forum, the largest stone got structure in, um, in uh, the, the, the northwest of the Roman Empire, north of the Alps, Kentish Ragstone. You can go and see part of that beneath the barber shop in Leadenhall Market to this day. You've got the uh, Vexillation Fort at um, Cripplegate, beneath uh, the Modern Museum of London, Kentish Ragstone, and it goes on. And, and many people will find it boring, but I love it. You've got the <laughs> installation of the amphitheatre, Kentish Ragstone. Most importantly, yeah. though, for the story, to help me tell you the economic model that's in play here, you've got the Severn and Land Wall here, not the River Wall that was built later, and that's an important part of the story as well, because that's not built from Kentish Ragstone. But the Land Wall is. So there you have a built em environment which comes from holes in the ground within a kilometre of where I'm talking to you from right now in East Farley at River of Maidstone. So if you can move can I, on. Can I just point out that where it says bathhouse on this map is not our bathhouse. It's not Billingsgate. That is Huggin Hill. And our bathhouse is over the eastern side of the uh, the bridge. Just for anybody who's getting a bit confused, there were some public bathhouses in London, but the Billingsgate bathhouse is um was a private bathhouse and yeah it's it's kind of just south of the forum basically um on the on the river side 
on the east side of the bridge. One more point I make, by the way, Kim, here, and, and, and this, this references exactly what you're saying as well. This, this image also enables me very briefly to touch on how Roman London came to being. So if you if you um, can make the case that uh, there are Roman traders here, sort of probably based on Cornhill, established between the Caesarean incursions and the Claudian invasion. So Cornhill, we can see here broadly around where the Basilica and Forum is, possibly slightly to its east. All the fine buildings in Roman London are there on Cornhill. So the Basilica and Forum, the, the, the temples, you can see the governor's palace here, et cetera, near to the river. And then you've got the Warbrook, which was a very uh, important uh, element of uh, Roman London. It's much more distinctive than it is today because because um, it's been covered over today. All the buildings to the west of the Warbrook tend to be the less refined buildings because that was developed later. So that's where you have the Mithraeum, for example, a dodgy quote unquote Eastern, Eastern religion um, away from the fine public buildings uh, on, on, on Corn Hill. And then you've got um, you've got the Vexillation Fort and the Amphitheatre. Every, anything to do with the Hoi Polloi, it's all to the west of the Warbrook. Uh, and that's why it's interesting where the bathhouse is, of course, Kim, because the bathhouse is well away towards the east, towards where the, the, the land wall was later built. Yeah, and yet it's quite a late building, so it's quite interesting, yeah. Right, anyway, shall we move on? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So if we move on to the next slide. So here I can give you some statistics to wow you about the scale of the industry involved here. So I'll use as a principal example the several land walls. So this is a late second century, AD 1199, 3.2 kilometre circuit built by Septimius Severus following the defeat of the British usurper Clodius um, Al Albinus. What a British name that is. Um, who almost beat Severus at the Battle of Lugdunum. So Severus really decided to go to town when he brought recalcitrant Britain back into the province. And building the land wall wasn't a, a, a process to keep people out. It was to tell the people in London who the boss was, saying deliberately in a monumental way, if I can do this, think what I can do to you if you misbehave again. And he really went to town on it. So this features 35,000 cubic metres of ragstone, uh, comprising over 1 million squared and very well-dressed ragstone blocks. That's 45,000 tonnes of ragstone for the facing alone. That's an inner and outer face, which I estimate in my PhD research at 1,750 voyages of the ship I showed you earlier. And again, I estimate for the first time in my research that up to 750,000 man-hours needed to construct the land walls. So that is possibly one of the most significant construction enterprises in Britain after the construction of the likes of Hadrian's Wall and the Antonine Wall. So mm. if we move on, and then we can see just an image here, we can see part of the land wall being built. Um, that's near where the Tower of London is. In fact, Kim, one of those buildings probably would have been the initial phase of the Billingsgate bathhouse or near, nearby to it anyway. Oh, yeah, yeah, so absolutely. Pretty pictures. And then we've got Aldgate there as well, which was built at Kentish Ragstone. And then I won't touch on it properly at the moment, but you can see here later when the River Wall is built, the bastions are built at the same time. And that's not built from Ragstone and neither are the bastions. So if we move on. So there we can see some nice images of the, the various grand buildings built from the Ragstone. You've got the Basilica and Forum. You've got the Governor's Palace with its fine mosaics and fish ponds. And there's a section of the Basilica you can see beneath the barber shop in Lednor Market. If you move on, there's the second iteration of the um, amphitheatre there, uh, which is built built with Kentish ragstone, um, which has been un uncovered and is presented in a remarkable way, I have to say, um, beneath the Guildhall Library, one of my favourite places to go. In fact, there you can see, I think, I, I, I may be wrong, but I think I'm right in saying that the, the, the room to the left, bottom left of the picture, that might have been one of the holding pens for the beasts to add to the entertainment of the people joining. And then you can see here the... Sorry, I've got someone knocking at my door, which is very annoying in the middle of this. Hey, let's ignore it. Someone else is going to go get it. Well, <laughs> I, 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 well I, I, and then you can see here you have the, um, you have the uh, original uh, display of the Mithraeum, which is now, of course, in a much grander place and setting, a fantastic place to go and visit beneath uh, the Bloomberg building. And that you can see number one poultry in the background as well, which is obviously an important archaeological site in London. So there, there you go. I mean, it's all about Kentish Rexton, Kim. It's all about Kentish Rexton. <laughs>
And not just the grand buildings, Kim, but the smaller buildings as well. All the townhouses, great and small, are mostly built where the stone's been used from Kentish Regstone. So, for example, when excavations have taken place along the, both the west and the eastern bank of the Warbrook, you can see there at least the foundations. Some, sometimes the whole structure are built from Kentish Regstone. So if we move on, we're now going to go on to the wider story, where the quarries were. So the, the detective story begins. So this is my favourite image in the whole deck, actually. It's a great, it's very straightforward um, a Google Earth grab. Uh, you've got London uh, as the sort of um, square mile, which it actually is a square mile, in the top left, you can see there, and then my five ragstone quarries. And you can see this is a, an enormous undertaking. So when you're quarrying and transporting using stone to build things, you would choose to actually transport it and build it from somewhere much nearer to where the construction is taking place because it's expensive in particular to transport. Well, this stone is so good, it's coming from 127 kilometres away if you measure the distance around all the various bends in the rivers, which is the uh, upper and lower Medway and then the um, Thames Estuary and then the River Thames. Mm. And the key thing there is that this is such a long distance. It's a two-stage, two-day two day journey. So when the, when the boats are picking up the stone from the quarries, and I'll talk about the, 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 the economic model a little later, uh, they're doing an overnight stop on the way. So basically they're doing an overnight stop probably around the um, Sheerness or on the Hoo Peninsula. So this is a two days, two day there, two days there, two days back. So it's a very, very intensive operation. And if we move on, you can see there an image from my PhD uh, thesis, which um, shows you, uh, and people can uh, look at this at their leisure if they, they wish to, you can see all the various sites in the lower and upper Medway Valley. But the principal thing to look at is here is all of the quarries, the five, are all in the upper Medway Valley. We, upper Medway Valley means upper river, which means above the tidal reach. So they're in a part of the river where it's not tidal. So you can't use the energy of the tide to transport the stones on the boats. Mm. Therefore, we've got to come up with a mechanism to firstly canalise the river to make the river deep enough to actually operate large ships in. And that's where the locks and weirs come in. And then you've got to have the means of actually transporting to the means of powering the boats to get them to the tidal reach of the river where the tide kicks in. But I'll talk about that a little bit later. And if we move on. This is another image I like, actually. This is Maidstone. This is the Maidstone bend uh, of um, the River Medway. So where I'm talking to you from now, if you look bottom left, the villa I've spoken about within eyesight of where I'm talking, it's the one nearest the bottom left. That's East Farley. Um, and you can see the dense urban concentration at right. That is Maidstone. Uh, now, in the Roman period, there was no Maidstone. Maidstone is, a, is, is a, an early medieval founding. So what you have here instead are a series of villas all associated with the quarries um, so the villas here um, i'll go talk about the quarries later the one to the farthest north that's allington castle and then you're going south you have on the western bank of the river there's one beneath mason girls grammar school <laughs> the one on the right that is the mount villa a very large villa that's beneath mason east railway station um, the one in the middle, that's at Florence Road in Maidstone. And if you ask me at the end, Kim, I'll tell you about how your viewers here can see an excavation on that site on television soon. And then you have the two at East Farley as well. So that picture shows you Roman Maidstone, even though there was no Maidstone. So if you move on. So what I want to talk about now is very briefly the methodology I use to identify the quarries. And then I'll tell you where the quarries are. And then I'll go through them one by one. So uh, my task was to identify giant holes in the ground <laughs> from which the stone was extracted in the Roman period to build the built environment. And to do that, I decided to, in the first instance, go back to the very first high quality sequence of maps I could get hold of for Kent. And this is the 1797 series of ordnance survey maps. These are immaculate maps, and these were drawn by the military to enable the military established in Britain during the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars to have total control over the ground here in case the French invaded. So they're very, very accurate. And on those maps, I broadly knew where the band of ragstone flowed through. It's worth referencing here, by the way, although the ragstone seam in the um, lower green sand is 
uh, extractable even today in Folkestone and Maidstone and Southern Oaks. It's only that in Maidstone which the Romans used, and we know that because that's the only one with a certain type of fossil in, which all the Roman stone has in. Okay, so I knew where the band of stone went through um, to look for the quarries, and I knew it was going to be around Maidstone because of the fossils. So therefore, I looked for the giant holes in the ground, which at that which were clearly man-made, and which at that time in 1797 were extinct and overgrown. So they'd been out of use for a long period of time. They're of a scale where they certainly wouldn't be medieval, so you're looking back to the Roman period. And that gave me eight. I found eight. And of those eight, I then went to the Kent Historic Environment Record, and for each of them, looked at each site to look at the um, archaeological remains from the Roman period found around them to see if there was any smoking guns, which could help identify this as a Roman site and settlement. Uh, and then finally, having narrowed it down to five, I went into each one and having spoke to expert Roman stonemasons, or rather stonemasons who are expert in Roman um, stonemasonry, I knew what to look for in terms of the quarrying marks. And in each of the five, I found Roman quarrying marks. In one case with my very patient wife, Sarah, holding me up halfway up a, a scree slope in uh, pouring rain next to a Tesco's in Tobble, where I had a eureka moment because I actually found a sequence of Roman quarry marks, which left, meant, left Sarah very, very baffled. So that enabled me to identify the, the Roman quarries. It narrowed down and narrowed down until we found the archaeology to prove it. So the quarries are at Allington, which is on the modern tidal reach, which is above the tidal reach in the Roman period. Then at Borton on Chelsea, which is above the tidal reach and above modern Maidstone. Dean Street, which is again above modern Maidstone, and that's the 2.6 kilometre long one. Quarry Wood at West Farley, which is above the tidal reach, and which is associated, I argue, with the Dean Street one. And finally, Teeson, where I'm excavating the villa associated with the quarry. Okay, only a couple of slides to go. So, conclusions. So, it might, to conclude, this is probably one of the only wordy slides on my deck. Uh, Ragstone is vital for the early development of Roman London. Quarries have been identified in the Upper Medway Valley, my PhD which is available here, if you don't mind me showing, Ragstone to Richard through Bar. So that's peer-reviewed as well, which is all good, isn't it, Kim? Oh. Um, carried by Blackfriars One Star Merchant Vessels, I argue, down the Medway and the Thames. Managed and facilitated by contractors, or I believe actually the Classis Britannica. I think it's the same procurator metallorum operating the whole industry. Um, it disappears in the middle of the third century, along with the fleet and the iron industry in the wield. So next steps, while well, we're carrying on our T's and Villa excavation every year, although possibly not this year, um, we were going to continue, the, the team excavating and doing an amazing job excavating uh, the East Farley Villa. Uh, they're going to continue um, digging there, I hope, as well. Uh, the Medway Stones in the River, that's on my that's a priority on my list. So as soon as we, I can get into the river properly, that's going to be a major excavation, hopefully as seen on TV. Um, the Dean Street Quarry investigation is going to continue looking for that possible um, uh, uh, canal down the middle uh, to help transport the stone. I'm going to see if I can trace a link from my Dean Street Quarry Road to the 229. So that is also then an ancillary road. And finally, I'm going to revisit the Dean Street Road burial stroke milestone site. And then we can see on the last image, if I may, Kim, <laughs> there he is. There's the big boy. Oh. Standing on top of an ash heap. I have to tell you, he doesn't look like that at the moment because he's not been to a groomer's for about two and a half months. <laughs> <laughs> but fortunately, he's going on Saturday. So, <laughs> oh. um, but, very so useful co worker. Yeah. Superb co, co worker. And I would actually introduce him on camera, but he's, you might be able to hear him snoring behind me because he's a bit older than that now. Um, and then finally, my close off slide that's just some of my books. Crucially, though, um, please, people, please do um, get in touch if you want to ask me any questions. There's my email address. I've got my own website where you can pick up any of my publications from magazines, etc. And also follow me on Twitter because I give, a, I give put, put out all my intellectual property uh, on Twitter all the time. So I'm doing two or three posts a day on Twitter with all updates on my research. So with that, I, I'm finished, but I'll take any questions you guys have got. <laughs> Thank well, you so much, Simon. Amazing. Yeah, I'd just like to thank you, Simon. I thought that was amazing. I mean, just so much archaeology and really interesting to have the quarry sites, but also have the infrastructure around the quarry sites and to have such a, an exciting ongoing project. Projects, a huge projects, yeah. To do, yeah. Um, 
very tolerant family. One, one thing I did wonder was um, Kentish Ragstone, you know, we can see the huge scale of this industry. And yes, we know it's been used locally and we know that most of it's been used in London, but has it been found anywhere else? In terms of, in term, right, so fantastic question, okay, because what it enables us to do is to zoom in very, very, very tightly on the economic model. Um, so some of the Saxon shore forts uh, in East Anglia, southern East Anglia, they feature Kentish Ragstone. So it's certainly being sent around the, the southern uh, East Anglian coast. Um, and we're finding it all the way down the river systems as well. So all the villas in the Darrant Valley are Ragstone. Uh, some of the fine sarcophagus is actually uh, used, and some of the cemeteries there are. They're also ragstone. Ragstone is obviously used in the Medway Valley because it's here. It's nearly all ragstone. Although interestingly, as you go into the Down River area, you're nearer the um, North Downs, so you start finding chalk being used as well. Uh, Rochester itself is principally ragstone. Almost certainly, in fact, no, it's factually not. Almost certainly, the bridge piers of the Roman Bridge at Rochester, which was remember the second longest bridge in Roman Britain. Remember that London Bridge apparently was uh, the bridge piers were wooden. So, so the bridge on the Medway, um, the Roman Bridge with its drawbridge in the middle, the rags, that that was the longest bridge in Britain, which had stone built bridge piers, and then sequentially all the way around the sort of East Kent coast. Uh, and as you go towards the East Kent coast, you find more and more local materials being used, but still the ragstone is being used because it's the best building stone. But in terms of distance, what you're looking at probably the furthest is in southern East Anglia, which is a really great question. So, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I think that if anyone, uh, there's probably lots of questions that you can think of that the viewers that we haven't thought of asking Simon because Andrew and I are both archaeologists as well so there's certain things that we kind of pick up and don't realise that other people might not. So um, do get in contact with Simon um, at these in using his email or um, on Twitter um, and also you can um, talk to us as well on Twitter um, or on Facebook. You'll find Billingsgate Roman House and Baths on there and ask us a question. If you don't have either of those, you can also go to our website, which is cityoflondon.gov.uk forward slash bathhouse, and you'll find our email address on there. Um, as you can imagine, we're not really um, on the end of a phone at the moment because we're working from home, but we are still at the end of an email. Um, so do uh, contact us if you've got any questions for us or for Simon um, about his work. Um, and I just want to say again, thank you so much. That was a absolutely fascinating that on all of the huge amounts of discoveries that you've made are um, just mind-boggling um, it's a it, you know just to realize that there's still so much of this archaeology out there that hasn't been discovered and there's still so much for us to do uh, guys it's an absolute pleasure thank you so much and, and, and again I can't recommend to people enough to go and support the, the Billings Gate Bathhouse. It's an amazing place to go and see and support. Oh, thank you. That's great. <laughs> thank you. So we're going to say goodbye now. So um, a listening, we're going to be talking. Uh, in fact, Andrew's going to be introducing us to the Roman Amphitheatre next time, aren't you, Andrew? I am, yeah. So something to look forward to, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> possibly, of course it is. Um, so thanks, everybody, for listening. and. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.